Good morning, everybody. I am Linda Barrett, and I am the manager of the Fort Worth History Center, and we are excited to be here with the Center for Texas History at TCU. Um, before we get started, I would like to share a few upcoming programs with you. Um, on Saturdays at the Riverside Branch Library, there is the Senior Social Hour, and that is from 3 to 5 in the afternoon every Saturday. And then if anybody is looking to brush up on their computer skills, we have a variety of classes that are ongoing. Um, there's a class for Microsoft Word at the new Lincoln Branch Library that's down um, in South far Southwest Fort Worth off of McHart. That program happens on Tuesday, October the 10th from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. And then in the evenings we have a couple of other programs. One on using Google Docs. That's on October the 10th. That's Tuesday from 6.30 to 7.30 at the East Regional Library. And then here at Southwest, also on Tuesday, October the 10th from 6.30 to 7.30, there will be a class on using Microsoft Excel. And then also we have, as part of our ongoing author series, uh, Amy Martin will be speaking about the experiencing the wild side of Dallas-Fort Worth. And she'll be here in this same room on Wednesday, October the 11th from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. So uh, glad Did everybody is. Did you have a list of those posted somewhere? I wouldn't they're on the website. Okay. Yeah, they're on the library's website. There's actually a tool called the Fun Finder, and if you go in there, you can search by location, by date, you know, whether you want adult programs or kids <coughs> programs. So it, it really helps narrow it down because we do offer a wide variety of programming. So um, welcome also to our Zoom audience. And um, I am going to turn things over to Cody Scott. She is the graduate assistant at the Center for Texas Studies at TCU. Good morning. It's finally a nice fall day. Uh, welcome to another. Uh, welcome to another edition of the Predicting Our Past Lecture Series. We bring you these wonderful speakers through the generosity of the Summerlee Foundation and the Summerfield G. Roberts Foundation. Programs are held September through May, normally the first Saturday of the month, with the goal of demonstrating the importance of preserving our history and to give <coughs> tools and encouragement to be a historian or preservationist yourself. To learn more about Center activities, Texas history, and research tips, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Center for Texas at TCU. And if you provided your email address on our sign-in sheet, we will make sure you receive timely program notices. Next month, we'll be joined by TCU's Dr. Alex Hidalgo and some of his graduate students for Aztec Pottery Reported Missing, the 2001 Antiquities Heist at TCU on November 4th. Uh, that program will be on TCU's campus for one time only to accommodate the library survey and the voting location. Uh, today, we welcome Dr. Jean Allen Smith and Jackson Pearson. Dr. Smith is a professor of history at Texas Christian University and the director of the Center for Texas Studies. He recently served as the class of 1957 Distinguished Chair in Naval Heritage at the U.S. Naval Academy for the second time. He is the author or editor of 14 Great books, story. as well as numerous articles and reviews on the War of 1812, naval and maritime history, and territorial expansion along the Gulf of Mexico. Among his most recent books is the one he'll be talking about today, and In Harm's Way, The American Military <coughs> Experience. He's a prize-winning teacher, having received awards at TCU and at Montana State University Billings, and from 2007 to 14, was also a curator of history at a major Fort Worth museum. Which one? I'm just curious. Uh, <laughs> um, Jackson Pearson is a PhD candidate at TCU, where he works in the Center for Texas Studies. His research examines the neutral ground, neutral ground agreement and the Louisiana-Texas borderland from 1803 to 1821. He has published book chapters into. related to his research and transactions of, transactions of 
of the American Philosophical Society, a book in Spanish, but the title is translated to Engineers for Peace, Soldiers for War, and he also has a chapter in the forthcoming Republic of Scoundrels. He has also received grants from the American Philosophical Society, the Texas General Land Office, the Louisiana Historical Association, the Doc Briscoe Center of American History, and the TCU History Department to support his research. So please welcome me, or join me in welcoming Daphne and Teague. Hello, all. Hello. Okay. Let me see if I can get this set up so we can share. I think just okay. there you go. Share screen. There we go. If you need to, you can move you around on the yeah. screen if there's something else. Yeah. Move this slide to right up here. <coughs> Click from current slide. Top left. From current slide. You can put four. It's easier to hit for that little one. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for being here today. Um, but this particular book here about TCU, TCU's first 100 years, pictures and stories, it's basically the chancellor asked me to do this book. I've, been, I've founded the Center for Texas Studies in 2003, so this is, we are now in 20 years of doing these Saturday morning presentations. And because, because of the center, I mean, when you look at this seal, one of the things that stands out to you is the year 1873. Well, TCU's origins really harken back to an earlier date. In fact, TCU was founded by Addison and Randolph Clark. They had both been Civil War veterans. Randolph had served a little bit in the Army, but his brother had been in the Army. But after the war, they returned to Fort Worth. And in fact, Addison was teaching at a private school here in Fort Worth in the early part of 1869 that had been created by John Peter Smith. And then Randolph was teaching at a small school in Birdville. Well, by the fall of 1869, the two brothers founded their own institution, a disciples-based male and female seminary of Fort Worth. This would be a, the first continuously co-educational institution west of the Mississippi River. And while a lot of people disagree that TCU is the oldest, we have factual evidence that prove that. It is the oldest continuously co-educational institution west of the Mississippi River. And in fact, when the school started, it had 33 female students, 22 male students. So even then, there were more women than men. <laughs> The average age was from early grade level to late adolescence. Now, interesting thing about it was that the school sat downtown. It was in a part of town that today is known as Hell's Half Acre, where the modern day Civic Center is, Convention Center. And the exact late location of the of the institution is still being debated. There's some claims that said it was on the block between 4th and 5th Street facing Main. There's other claims that said it was on the south end of Jones and Calhoun between 9th and 14th Street. But nonetheless, the school remained in Fort Worth from 1869 
1873. And in 1873, there's a huge financial panic that impacted the nation. The panic of 1873, and in fact, what Randolph said was that the inequities of that panic, it created human wreckage and debris. And the days and nights were hideous. And even though the, the school was still trying to flourish despite the economic crisis, he said that the fighting the whirlpool of licentiousness and greed took too much energy and it tempted the young men far too much. He said they were caught up like insects in a street light and being concerned for the welfare of the young men and young women and being in Hell's Half Acre, which if you know anything about Hell's Half Acre, it was an area with bars and gambling and prostitution. It was kind of a, you know, I guess you could say it was much like Amsterdam today. <laughs> but nonetheless, the brothers would accept an invitation by a man named Pleasant Thorpe, who had created a little community in Thorpe Spring, Texas, near present-day Granbury, some 40 miles southwest of Fort Worth. And the brothers would relocate their school from Fort Worth, from Hell's Half Acre, to Thorpe Spring. And when they got there, what they found is that life wasn't as good as they anticipated. In fact, basically what they found was that their financial situation did not improve. In fact, small Christian colleges at the time were not doing very well in the country. And so they just barely got by. And while the institution struggled financially, the Clark brothers always believed that they had created the school for the students. In fact, they did not charge a matriculation fee. They did not charge for incidentals. And they certainly did not make a profit from student housing like TCU does today. I mean, if you look at TCU today, they basically charge about $8,000 a semester for students to live in dorms, which is kind of steep. But nonetheless, this approach basically showed that the, the Clark brothers were altruistic, and it differed markedly from most institutions of higher learning. Now, in 1889, the Clark brothers had to make a painful decision. That painful decision was because the school was having such horrible financial crises. And what they chose to do was turn over the school, including all of its assets, all of its debts, to the Brotherhood of Christian Churches of Texas which was the state governing body. And what they hoped is that this would bring financial relief to the school. It would help ease the school's debt and help improve the school's operating situation. But at the same time they were experiencing this financial crisis, there was also a religious crisis going on for the school. And among the issues of that religious crisis, Jackson's going to share a few things about what happened there. All right, so we pick up here in Thorpe Spring, and the church is at this, this point in the religion, the disciples of Christ are splintering. And if you can imagine, what might they be splintering over was the use of instruments during service. Right, and so it might see, you know, you know, not like a big deal to us today, but also there are still, you know, a number of traditions that abide by the same kind of philosophy. And so on one hand, you have the antis who oppose the use of mechanical instruments in service, and kind of the head of the antis was Joseph Clark, who was actually Addison and Randolph's dad. 
And for the side that is supporting the use of mechanical instruments in service, you have actually Addison, the sons, Addison and Randolph. So we have these two factions. And this all comes into a head. And what's, I guess, the sad part about it, in the fall of 1893, Adran Christian College had its largest enrollment with 445 students enrolled in courses. So this is the peak of this first period. We fast forward to February 1894, and it is the annual Community Revival Week, or Religious Emphasis Week is what they called it. And so it's where the school would invite the surrounding community to come in, and they would have a week-long series of religious revival events, you know, trying to recenter the students in their Christian faith. Now at this week, we have, this is kind of the peak of the antis and the pros. And at the beginning of the service, Addison Clark gets up and he offers a prayer. He calls for unity in the church and the school and the community. His father Joseph gets up and he offers a prayer. And he, you know, he emphasizes that while we are about unity, we're not going to stay here if you choose to use these mechanical instruments in service. Now the instrument at question was an SD organ that was made in North Carolina. It's a small little organ. And as they get done with the prayers, Addison calls out the first hymn. And Joseph and the rest of the aunties get up and walk out. And Addison turns, and this is where the, the affair in TCU lore earned its name. And Addison turned to the organist, Bertha Mason, and he said, play on Miss Bertha. <laughs> now, the repercussions of this were pretty significant on the institution. The next fall, the enrollment declined to 294 students. So that is about half, right? So a huge, steep decline. The school is basically in finance. I mean, we talked about financial crisis, but this is the point where the financial crisis is hitting. It cannot stay operating in Thorpe Spring. So to their, you know, kind of their savior actually is that city down south of Fort Worth that we don't like to talk about much here, Waco. <laughs> and the Waco Commercial Club and the Waco Christian Church offered to purchase the former Waco female college building, give it to Adran if the school would locate, and then they would throw in an additional $5,000 and 15 acres of land. So this is going to be the first of two times in TCU history where they receive an offer they just simply can't refuse. So Adran takes the offer, but they, there was one catch, right? This is 1894-95. They had to be in Waco before the start of 1896. So on Christmas Day, 1895, a train leaves from Thorpe Spring, today Granbury, and carries about 100 faculty, students, and you know, family members down to Waco they disembark the train at the station downtown, and then they head to a welcoming ceremony that was actually hosted by the minister of the First Baptist Church and president of Baylor, Rufus Burleson. So the interconnection here, you know, the intertwining histories are just fascinating. And after uh, a rousing speech welcoming Adran to Waco, the entire party paraded three miles to a grassy knoll, and here's another catch, a grassy knoll. You're gonna hear about a grassy knoll in a little bit in Fort Worth for some reason, you know, a grassy knoll with a lone academic building. That was key to getting TCU to move. So they get to the grassy knoll, they have the large, you know, the large educational building, and they were home. And here are some pictures with this kind of early period. So I'm gonna pass it back to Gene, and he's gonna talk about some of the years in Waco. Well, and, when they come back to Waco, it was supposed to bring financial relief, but it wasn't going to bring quite as much financial relief as they anticipated because the Christian church did not provide as much funding as they thought. The city of Waco did not provide as much funding. In fact, the financial promises never fully materialized. And on several occasions, the financial duress almost necessitated the closing of the university. But then, at this time in Waco, there were a number of important 
structural changes to the institution. In 1902, the university changed its name from Adran Christian College to Texas Christian University. It also adopted the colors purple and white, as you can see. <laughs> it also adopted the horn frog as the mascot. And in fact, the student newspaper, the Skiff, began publishing 1904. So TCU all of a sudden started getting more students, started growing. And in fact, this building that you see in the top right corner, that was the largest academic building in the entire southwestern United States. Well, that became the heart of this new campus. And everything seemed to be going reasonably well until the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back happened Tuesday, March 22nd, 1910. That major building with the, the tower on it, that was the heart of campus. That was the main building. And in fact, what was going to happen on that day, Monday or Tuesday, March 22nd, 1910, just shortly after 8 o'clock, Yes, we've had the changing of the, the institution, the skip, the horn frog, the colors. All of this had really created change. But then on that particular day, it says March 22nd, it's really March 23rd. And what happened about 8 o'clock that evening, as students were returning from camp to campus for mandated study sessions. Many students lived in this building. They had classes in this building. And then all of a sudden, about 8 p.m. that evening, some students in the building claimed they smelled smoke. They been, began scouring the building to try to find where that smoke was coming from. They eventually identified that the, the smoke was coming from the southwest, or pardon me, the northwest wing of the campus's main building in the attic. And in fact, a student who went up to examine where the smoke was coming from screamed out, fire, fire, the building's on fire. And the whole roof was ablaze. In fact, students on the lower two floors began cleaning out their rooms to save what they had. Those who lived on the fourth floor and even the third floor weren't able to save their stuff. But ultimately what was going to happen within two hours, the fire would gut this building. And in fact, all the students and all the townspeople could do is watch as the fire consumed the building. In fact, one TCU student later wrote, it looked like the entire city of Waco came out to see the fire. But most of them came to offer their homes to the hundred or more boys who now had no place to stay. Another student actually said, the catastrophe had drawn the students and townspeople together as they had never been before. Even before our hate for Baylor <laughs> was turned to admiration and love for the, by the kindness and the generosity of Baylor University in our hour of need. Well, the following day, the president T.E. Tomlinson, he called a special board of trustees meeting, and they said that they would meet on March 29, 1910, 
By that time, they would have to decide whether they would stay in Waco or they would relocate. By March 1910, a series of proposals, by March 29th, a series of proposals had started arriving in Waco to the leadership of TCU. And in fact, the proposals from four towns were the ones that were going to be considered. Those four towns, of course, were Waco. There was also a proposal from Dallas, a proposal from Fort Worth, a proposal from McKinney, and even a proposal from Gainesville in North Texas. Well, when they began meeting on March 29th, they evaluated the offers that were made. And in fact, the two offers that seemed to be to give TCU the most was an offer by the cities of Fort Worth and Dallas. But at the same time, the civic boosters of Dallas were actually trying to recruit a Methodist university. And in fact, that Methodist University would ultimately become SMU. <laughs> well, ultimately what would happen is that the offer made by the city of Fort Worth was just far more important. And in fact, Jackson will share a few thoughts about what was offered and Hopefully you will. <laughs> All right, so the offer from Fort Worth included a substantial uh, number of acres where the current campus is located today. About 50 acres. See, Gene knew this information. He threw it over <laughs> to me. So it included about 50 acres, but more importantly, it included a percentage of profits from a real estate uh, company and development uh, group that was founded by Eamon Carter. So whenever this group made sales, some of the proceeds would actually go into the university's uh, financial budget, right? So it kind of creates this, this rolling economy for the university. They also gave $200,000 to and, TCU. Yeah, a whole lot of money. But when TCU arrives in Fort Worth, are any of these buildings finished? No. So they come to Fort Worth, and initially they are going to go into a couple buildings that were known as the Ingram Flats. And you can actually see a picture of one of the buildings on the screen now. And on the first floor, there were classrooms, a dining hall, a chapel, office space, and a print room or print shop. And on the second and third floor, they actually had the dormitory space for the students. And what's interesting, if you look at this picture in the bottom right corner, you can actually see, uh, the, you see the windows and then the small row of windows above it. So you can actually see looking from outside the classroom back you know, toward the street. So it's a very fascinating, that was the first picture taken on, at the new school uh, when they opened in September, I think it's September 28th, 19, uh, 1910. And now, it's on Weatherford Street. So it's on Weatherford and Commerce, so it's diagonal from the Tarrant County Courthouse. So they had, they had some prime real estate. If they only could have held on to that a little <laughs> bit longer, right? Now, while this is going on, the first academic year is going to be downtown Fort Worth. City officials are scrambling, trying to get roads laid out, get utilities stretched out to this little grassy knoll southwest of downtown. And as this scramble is happening, construction crews are getting ready to start building the first three buildings that will be on campus. And as you can see, this top picture is actually a panoramic, a panoramic photograph of when they laid the cornerstone for at the, what was at the time called Main or Administration Hall. And today it is Reed Hall. And so that, that was the ceremony. And as you can see, the crowd is rather large. And on the, the bottom pictures, you can see where that little corner, where they laid the cornerstone. But they do this ceremony, and it's actually, construction's already begun. But the crowd is so big, they can't hear nor see what is actually happening. 
right? So it's very interesting. So we have the first building that opens in time for the 1911-1912 academic year, which is administration building, today's Reed Hall. You have Jarvis Hall, which was the women's dorm. And then you have Goud Hall. Now of these three, Goud Hall was actually torn down. And it's going to get real complicated. So Goud Hall was torn down. And today, that is where uh, Clark Hall is. And Clark Hall was a dormitory built in the 1950s. And the fourth building was called Clark Hall, which was torn down in the 1950s. And Sadler Hall was, create, was constructed there. So it gets a little, you know, there's multiple Clark Halls in our history. Now, so Clark Hall, 1914. And then the Bright College of the Bible is actually on the far left corner. And one of our favorite photographs that Dr. Smith and I like is actually taken from inside the doorway looking out at the campus. And I, we'll get to that one in a little bit. I believe it's on our Bright College slide. And then the gymnasium and natatorium, which is on the left side, it kind of occupies caddy corner. It kind of occupies that bend in the campus. So it was constructed in 1921. Now, as you can see, there is one lone tree in this photograph. It is in the bottom right corner. So there's, that was the first tree planted at TCU's campus. As you can tell, it was all a giant, I mean, you, when we say grassy knoll, right, it was just prairie land. And so that was the first tree planted. It was a gift from the senior class of 1912. And here's a picture of the tree today. And as you can see on the bottom left, there are a couple little trees. And so those were the first ones planted. And today when you drive down the university, you see all these giant trees. But yes, this is when it started. Well, they're not giant in Texas. <laughs> well, for Texas, they're giant. <laughs> now, how did students deal with this move? So we actually found a diary from a student named Ambeline Tyson. And her first semester at TCU was the 1909-1910 academic year. So she was a student when the building, when the, you know, the building burns down. And she said she recalled taking classes outside in the, you know, the grassy field, going in the dining hall, taking it, whatever space they still had on campus or where the, the classes were held that last year. And she and her classmates became greatly endeared to TCU. Just, I mean, this transient, this kind of traumatic experience. You know, you go to a school, it burns, and then she stays with it. And one of the things that we found in her diary that we absolutely, that was the, the coolest little story we both thought, Right the day before graduation, they had a small get-together with her and her classmates who had been through this, you know, this experience together. And she lamented she didn't have any souvenirs from the party. But she said, I shall never forget this and many other enjoyable times I have had at dear old TCU. And she believed the words of the old song, when I am an old lady with children 10 and 2, I'll teach them the alphabet begins with TCU. <laughs> I'm going to throw it back to Gene because he loves the streetcars. <laughs> yeah, among, among the positions I held before, I was the curator of history at a place called the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History when it reopened the new building there. And the first exhibit we did in that building was called, Let's Take the Streetcar. And... I remember the president at the time, Van Romans, was like, well, we need to do a streetcar exhibit. And being the curator of history, I analyzed our collection and looked at our inventory and said, we only have like 23 items that deal with streetcars. And I was like, but I've got an idea. Why don't we look at where the streetcars went? So we focused on different parts of town, like, we focused on the north side, we focused on TCU, we focused on Como, we focused on uh, Stop 6, which, you know, we call it Stop 6 today. It was never the sixth stop on a subway, <laughs> on a streetcar line. At one point, it was like number seven, at one point, it was like number 10, but the point is, I mean, we looked at all these different parts of town. Well, what you see here about TCU is that one of the promises that had been made to TCU is that all, in, all utilities would be brought out to the campus and a streetcar line would be brought out. 
Well, that streetcar line doesn't show up. And in fact, what they ended up doing, the gravel road, that is what today we call Forest Park Boulevard. And that was the only access because they didn't have a bridge across the Trinity. And so you came diagonally or, or basically stair step on your way to Fort Worth. Well, the streetcar finally arrived at TCU in 1916. The North Texas Traction Company that had been responsible for streetcars in the city actually finished the project. And when the streetcars arrived, the students were just overjoyed because streetcars were cheap, they were easily accessible. Students could ride the streetcar and go to downtown and take about 30 minutes. And how many of you have ridden the, the TRE from downtown Fort Worth to the airport? You know, when you get on that, you can read, you can, it's kind of relaxing. These streetcars were anything but relaxing. <laughs> In fact, what is said is that the big green bug, as it was often called, well, when they began, it began with a whir and a bang. And there was clanging and lurching and stopping, and each turn tossed the people <laughs> from side to side. The air was filled with sounds, and in fact, jostling people and constant movement. But even so, Trips from the campus to downtown became so popular that the company began decorating streetcars with banners and horn frogs and painting them purple because so many students were riding the streetcars. And you may or may not know, but unfortunately by the mid-1930s, you had the advent of automobiles and buses and roads and petroleum and the petroleum companies, the rubber companies that were producing tires, the automobile companies, they all began campaigning to get rid of the streetcars. And we did, unfortunately, here in Fort Worth. When we did that exhibit in 2009, there was actually a movement afoot downtown in the city council to re revitalize streetcars. And it never happened. But that's kind of disappointing because what ultimately happened as you drive around town today, you can still see where the streetcars went. Forest Park Boulevard, very wide road, streetcar went down that. Camp Bowie, very wide road, streetcar went down that. Basically, from downtown, what is North Main, all the way to the north side. Wide road, streetcar went down that. Generally, if you see a very wide road in Fort Worth today, you can almost attribute that to the fact that a streetcar went down that at one point in time. Well, by the time the streetcar had arrived, there were also other changes happening in Fort Worth. In fact, the first airplane came to Fort Worth in January 1911, when a Frenchman named Roland Garros, he flew his Bellero monoplane and he landed near present day Montgomery Plaza. There on Carroll Street, there's a monument to where the first airplane landed in Fort Worth. Well, after that, you started seeing more airplanes over the city. And by 1914, the world changed because by that year we had the beginnings of World War I. And all of a sudden, by 1917, you had the creation of Camp Bowie Army Base out on the west side of town, straddling modern day Camp Bowie Boulevard. And there you were training army men to serve in the war. Well, the Royal Canadian Air Corps also negotiated with the state of Texas to create flying fields in Texas. Why did they want flying fields in Texas rather than Canada? They thought, they thought the weather would be more accommodating 
for training pilots year round. Well, what they didn't know is that the winter of 1917-18 was one of the worst that Texas has ever experienced. But nonetheless, the Canadian Royal Flying Corps leased three airfields. One was called Talaferro Field Number 1, which was called Hicks Field. It was in North Richland Hills. You had Talaferro Field Number 2, which was in Benbrook. It was called Carruthers Field. You had Talaferro Field Number 3, which was in Everman, and it was called Barron Field. Well, ultimately what happens as the war, World War I, continued in its intensity, more and more pilots began training. And the fact that TCU represented a grassy knoll on the southwest corner of town, pilots flying out of Benbrook would often use that as a reference point. And then, as they used it as a reference point, they all of a sudden, these male pilots started realizing, there's girls down there. <laughs> and they started flying lower to take a look at them. Well, sometimes that created problems. In fact, I don't know if you knew it or not, but there has been two airplane crashes on the TCU campus. The first one was the most devastating. The first one was going to occur on March, Monday, March 27, 1917, when a pilot flying from Carruthers Field in Benbrook was flying over the TCU campus. He flew low. But all of a sudden, his elevator cables, they missed, they quit working. He wasn't able to raise the elevation of the plane. And as he was flying in front of the main building, the left wing struck the flagpole. Knocked the flagpole all the way to the ground. But as it did, the plane all of a sudden flew, or kind of whipped, flew, kind of turned over to the left, and the propeller hit the northwest or the northeast corner of what today is Reed Hall. And in fact, what was going to happen, you can see an area right here in this red circle. There was a revolving door, which is the north door to Reed Hall. There were three young women in that revolving door when the plane hit. And fortunately, they were not injured. But the plane's propeller knocked 24 feet of brick off the building. And in fact, as the propeller hit the northeast corner, the tail flung around and struck a, um, what is it called? Uh, arbor walk. The arbor walk. The arbor, yeah. Struck the arbor that was there on the, the south side of present-day Jarvis Hall. Well, the pilot wasn't injured. The young girls weren't injured. And before the end of the day, soldiers from Carruthers Field had arrived in trucks and they began cleaning up the mess. That was the first airplane crash. This wooden piece here is actually in special collections in the library. It is actually a part of that airplane that struck the TCU campus. A second episode happened in November 1917 when the Carruthers football team was playing the TCU football team across the street from Reed Hall or from the main building where today the, the, the TCU library is located. And in fact, toward the end of the game, a pilot landed, or pardon me, a pilot was taking off because the Carruthers players actually won the game. And as he was taking off near where present day UCC Christian Church is, his wheels hit a barbed wire fence and in fact, it tipped the plane up like you see here. It did damage to the plane. The pilot wasn't injured. And very soon there were 
fan from the game that were circling around the plane, and they were very curious what had happened, but they weren't very happy <laughs> because their team had lost. But nonetheless, they would end up, the, the Canadians would end up bringing a truck and carting the player and the, or the, the pilot and the plane away. Now, those were the two plane crashes that happened on the TCU campus. There's another episode that happened that was also right at the end of 1917. And this is an epidemic that is known as, oh, the university's first experience with a national pandemic. In fact, at the end of World War I, there would be a, a virus called the Spanish influenza that would be carried mostly by soldiers back and forth across the Atlantic. And that pandemic would ultimately kill more than 50 million people worldwide. By the fall of 1917, the epidemic had reached the DFW Metroplex. And in fact, it ultimately forced the soldiers at Camp Bowie to take special accommodation. They had to move their, their mattresses outside and sleep in the open air. And ultimately, even though you had these accommodations, more than 1,900 soldiers died because of the, the epidemic. Well, in October of 1917, by that point, 1,200 DFW citizens had already perished. And a Star Telegram article ran a huge headline. It said, Quarantine is placed on TCU by the influenza. Well, President Edward McShane, he forced the students to begin wearing masks to socially distance themselves. He instructed the students they had to take their mattresses out of the dorm during the day and let them air out so the disease would not stay there in the mattress. So as you can see outside of Clark Hall here, all the mattresses there on the ground. But probably to me what was most significant was that the university even created a temporary hospital on campus. On the third floor of Clark Hall, they created a hospital for students and for local townspeople. And this was going to help trying to prevent the spread of this pandemic, this virus. Now, there were openly some other things that happened. TCU sent its nursing students to Camp Bowie to take care of the soldiers. The art teacher, Dura Brokaw Cockrell, and there is a Cockrell Street right adjacent to TCU, she began sending her students out to do therapy for soldiers who were suffering from the, <coughs> the virus. She would teach them weaving, pottery, basketry, tool making, modeling, all kinds of things. But basically what had happened is that TCU tried to alleviate the crisis of the pandemic. And, you know, a hundred years later, we had a second pandemic. Basically what we see is that with the beginning of the 1920s, with the pandemic finally over, all of a sudden TCU began to change. And Jackson you want to share some things about how it changed? So we all know the heyday of TCU football, right? The 1920s to the 1940s. And then I guess you could argue from 2009 to today, we've had a pretty solid run as well. So what I want to do now, though, is highlight some other athletic teams that were on campus that had some major successes. So at first, during the Thorpe Spring and then the later Waco years, you kind of have this uh, societal 
I guess, realization that physical exercise can make students you know, perform better in the classroom. All right? They have more stamina to pay attention. You know, they don't fall asleep all the time, maybe. I don't know if this is true or not, you know, but this is just the thoughts of the time. So there start to become opportunities for female athletes on campus. And at first, this is in the 1890s and early 1900s, you have like tennis clubs, you have swimming clubs that pop up. A basketball team starts in 1904. And with the move to Fort Worth, these groups are really going to take off. And most notably, the Lady Frogs basketball team in 1912-1913 were regarded as the best female athletes in the state. All right, the Star Telegram would carry stories about how bad they would beat the local YWCA team. All right, they, they go undefeated. And actually, what the student newspaper would carry stories of was how whenever the first team and the second team would scrimmage in practice, that was the best game that to be had in the entire state. And so they actually have some pictures. You can see uh, we have photos of the team. Now, they also, at the time, you know, you still have the uh, stigma, right? And so the men would play a full court, and they only had the ladies play a half court. So I'm just thinking of, like, whenever you go play pickup at the, at the court, you know, you get three on three, you're not running the full court. But, and you can also see the uniforms, right, long black dresses that would be tucked in, right? But whenever the first team and the second team would scrimmage, there would be a giant crowd of all the students that would gather around to watch the game. So this becomes kind of this first big buzz on campus for female sports. And the second one was actually the dormitories would organize competing tennis clubs, and they would play all of the teams in Fort Worth. And you had the Never Nets and the Scorpions. And each spring, they would hold a tournament with the winner being crowned TCU champ, and then they would play like a city champ for a city final. Now all of this, you know, you kind of have these expanding opportunities, but by 1917, as we just talked about with World War I and the Spanish influenza, coverage of women's sports disappears from the, the Horn Frog Annual. So for, there's about a 10 year gap where there's no mention of female athletic teams. Instead, they would have a section dedicated to female students enrolled in the domestic sciences. So, ladies, I'm sorry. You know, that, that was a bad time to be a star athlete. Now, a, the second kind of craze that takes over TCU campus occurs in the 1930s, you know, kind of the, the end of the Great Depression. And in 1933, the Ex-Students Association wanted to put on a performance of Romeo and Juliet. So we're thinking traditional play, how does this lead to a sporting, you know, the sports revolution on campus? Well, the director, William Gonder, hired his friend Herman Beckman, he was a German immigrant, to teach all of the students the art of fencing so they could choreograph the fight scenes in the play to be as realistic as possible. About four months later, you have the first fencing clubs on campus. And it becomes this kind of, I mean, each semester they would have a, fan, a fencing championship. And in 1936, this was kind of the inaugural tournament where all students were included. There is a, the skiff ran a huge story on the championship match because Richard Oliver won the inaugural tournament at the price of his pants. <laughs> so in the semifinal and the final, his opponents had poked off the buttons on his, on his shirt and on his trousers, and one of them even slashed a hole across the seat of his pants and down his leg that they said was about a yard long. So I don't know what he still had on by that point. <laughs> but more importantly, the TCU women's fencing clubs would go on to win several Southwest Regional Championships. All right, you can see the headlines here in the Star Telegram, right in the middle of the screen. They, become, they became these like fencing celebrities in the region. They would travel around, compete in nationals. So they have this high level of success. Now, simultaneous to this fencing craze, you have boxing. And boxing kind of takes over the campus each spring. So TCU would hold annual tournaments in the spring, and their crown champions would then compete in the Fort Worth Golden Gloves tournament. 
And what they did is they scheduled the semi, now this is kind of tough, I can't imagine being one of these students participating in it. On Wednesday nights, they would schedule the semifinal bouts. And they had six different weight classes. They'd have two, two fights per weight class. And on Saturday night at 9 o'clock, they would start the championship night. So they'd have six fights. So these guys would have to, you got to win on Wednesday, then you got to win on Saturday. And if you do that, then about two weeks later, you got to go fight in the Golden Glow in the city tournament. And several of these fights, such as the 1937 scrap between Bobby Bass and O.A. Ritchie, almost brought the gymnasium down. More than 500 fans were jumping, screaming, and it just takes off. Now, unfortunately for some of the heavier weight classes, you know, if you, uh, there were some football players who were also extremely talented boxers. So I don't know which students were brave enough to take it up against the defensive linemen. But Glenn Bull Rogers was a handful. And so this is actually a picture of him fighting against another TCU student in the uh, Golden Gloves tournament for the city of Fort Worth. And Bull Rogers won the 36 and 37 heavyweight crowns at TCU and for the Fort Worth Golden Gloves. So he clearly had some skill. Other students, such as Buster Nix, would win the 1940 light heavyweight title. And then the 46 and 47 TCU boxing teams won the Fort Worth District team trophies. So there's kind of this rich tradition of fencing and boxing that takes over. Now I'll be brief with the football. We had a lot of coverage for this this last year with the national championship run. So as you can see in the top left, you have Clark Field, which is where the library is today. Football, obviously, in the 1920s, TCU becomes a very good team under Matt Bell and Francis Schmidt. So in 1928, Eamon Carter takes a, just this tremendous interest in the TCU football team and he sees the success of the football team being intertwined with the success of Fort Worth. So he throws his money to help build Eamon Carter Stadium, which is located where it is today. Obviously it's been renovated, torn down, rebuilt, right? But he funded $350,000 to build the stadium. And in 1929, TCU wins its first Southwest Conference championship. And as we know, 1935 national champions, 1938 national champions, Sammy Ball, Davey O'Brien, you know, this is the peak of TCU football. And I'd like to point out, from 1923 to 1945, TCU went 157 wins, 68 losses and 16 ties. So that is a tremendous 22 year run. And I'm going to throw it back to Gene for the library. Well, and there are a number of people who have had instrumental roles in helping TCU develop the way it has. This is one of them right here, Mary Couch Burnett. She never attended TCU. But she was married to a wealthy Fort Worth cattle baron named Burke Burnett. And Burke Burnett had always said that none of his money would ever go to a religious or an academic institution. And certainly not a religious academic institution. Well, you probably know the story about her. She, he placed her in an insane asylum for a while and she was able to escape. And by the time she had escaped, her husband had died and she inherited the estate. And when she inherited the estate, she was well off, but she ultimately decided because her father had supported Addison and Randolph Clark when they were in Thorpe Springs. And because of that, she agreed to support TCU. Furthermore, her personal physician was a man named Charles Harris, who is the name of the current Harris Nursing School. It was named after him. So she agreed to give $3 million to TCU in 1923. And of that money, she said $150,000 of it had to be earmarked for the construction of a new library. That would be the new library. And the key to that was the nice little 
fish pond out front. <laughs> well, we have a designed, newly designed library in the last few years, and it has a area out front that's shaped like that, but it's not a pond. It's just a flower bed now. But nonetheless, her contribution, her three million in 1923, it equates to about 46 million today. And that, that was what made TCU financially. That got us out of the hole and gave us a sense of confidence and a sense of well-being. And other boosters that have helped over the years. Eamon Carter, you heard how he helped bring TCU to Fort Worth. You heard how he helped create the, the Eamon Carter Stadium with his own money, but he also got the city of Fort Worth, he got townspeople to donate 60% of the cost of the construction of, this, of the stadium. But you also may know that he was involved in a lot of other things. He helped bring the first um, Air Force airplane building plant to Fort Worth. He convinced Southern Air Transport, which is now American Airlines, to relocate from Dallas to Fort Worth. He also convinced several oil companies to come to Fort Worth, as well as Air Force Plant Number 4, which was created during World War, I, World War II, and that is now the headquarters for Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. He also convinced Bell Helicopter, which is now Bell Helicopter Textron, and he even supported TCU over the year, not just its sports programs. When, when um, Davey O'Brien won the Heisman Trophy, he had a stagecoach and horses transported to New York so he could be taken from his hotel to the site of the awarding of the Heisman Trophy in a stagecoach. <laughs> well, that was kind of cool. But he later served on the TCU Board of Trustees. He supported the construction of several buildings on campus, including Foster Hall, Landreth Hall, Winton Scott Hall. And even after his death in June of 1955, he created the Eamon Carter Foundation, which has continued to serve as a major financial supporter to TCU over the years. So Eamon Carter had played a major role. Additionally, Colby, Colby Hall. Colby Hall is a name, but it's also a dorm. Colby Hall was Adran Christian College's first football team's quarterback. He later transferred from TCU, studied at Transylvania, got his BA, then he eventually got his his M.A. at Columbia University, and by 1912, he had come back to Fort Worth to work at TCU as an educational secretary. He would later become a number of things, including a professor of Christian science or Christian education. He would also publish a number of religious books, including this one, which is the first history of TCU called the History of Texas Christian University, a college of the cattle frontier. Well, a number of other things that have happened, but we're running out of time, so we're going to have to kind of fly through these. All right, for the sake of time, we got to speed up. Obviously, when historians get a captive audience, we like to hold you as long as we can. <laughs> But we're going to skip ahead there. We have fascinating stories in the book about the beginning of Bright College of the Bible, TCU in World War II, and actually right in the middle, Harrison Miller Mosley was a TCU graduate, and he served on the Manhattan Project uh, and helped uh, develop the centrifuges that could separate uranium to make the atomic bombs. So he was actually a graduate student in North Carolina. Very fascinating story. Uh, TCU integrated over the process of about 21, 22 years. So it's this long integration process that starts with the professional schools, like the, college, the evening college, 
the Bright Divinity School, College of Education, the College of Nursing, all these programs integrate in this 20 year period before the main campus does in 1964. And in then fact, it began integration during the period of World War II. Yes, during World War II. World War II also leads to the clay tile roofs, air conditioning comes to campus, and there was a TCU airport, all this is in the book. And what we want to end today, we have biographical vignettes on a whole host of characters. We're going to end today with the evolution of the mascot. Now, the TCU mascot gets its name. We learned from in 1902, Addie, little Addie coins, you know, horn frogs. And the reason why is because he said it sounded a whole lot more intimidating than the fighting preacher boys. <laughs> And pretty much from the beginning, a young child would be the mascot and would wear like a, a jersey number, maybe one half, and stand on the sideline. A series of dogs were adopted by different sports teams. The marching band was gifted a goat after they played at the Fort Worth Stock and Exposition Show. So you have all these animals. But in 1949, Jimmy Pascal was a student, and he developed the idea for a costume mascot to stand on the sideline. And the student government earmarked $50 for the construction of this suit. And it was kind of like paper mache together. I don't know how he managed to wear it and it didn't fall apart. <laughs> but they turned, you know, they coined the term Addy the Frog. Then they changed it to Addy the Fighting Frog. And by the 1960s, there was an annual tryout. They were sponsored by the TCU cheerleaders and the student government because they had a lot of people who could win the vote but weren't necessarily good mascot material. <laughs> So they tried to, to wean them out, and in 1973, for the, or for the centennial at the time, you actually had the first iteration of Super Frog. And so you can see he kind of looks similar. He's right beneath the TCU 100. He looks a little similar to the Super Frog today. Now, in between, in the intervening years, there were some weird ones that came out. I call one of them like Moon Frog. Um, anyway, you know, I don't know. And today we have Hypnotoad. And, yeah, now we got Hypnotoad, so maybe we're going back in time with these. <laughs> but with that, we will conclude. So thank you all so much for being here. And, well, and one of the things I want to tell you is that, you know, TCU has been here in Fort Worth now for 113 years since it returned. And during that time, you've had a partnership of growth with the city and the university, growth, mutual enrichment, and community throughout the 20th century. Well, interesting, our original 1873 charter states that Adran Christian University would fulfill its mission to promote literary and scientific education. And today, the university still works to promote those basic ideas. And so, thank you so much. And if you're interested, we have copies of the book in the back. So you can always go get yourself one. And we'd be happy to sign it if you'd like. So thank you so much for being here today. You make them up, we'll make up answers. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I've uh, seen where the, the original location, Hell South Beggar, that there's a planning of the location at 4th and 5th. Yeah. But what is your reasoning for what is the other location? Well, uh, over time, there have been, there have been different uh, locations that have been pointed out through historical sources. So as a historian, you know, you always go back to the time period and you try to look at what the sources tell you. So we've got at least two to three different sources that it was telling us. What sources? Pardon? Do I have to buy the book to find out the sources? <laughs> It'll help. Do I don't remember all the sources. <laughs> what started the Waco fire? The Waco fire, from what we understand, it was an electricity fraud. I mean, electricity. Uh, yeah, it could have been a short. Yeah, it. Yeah. It. So they actually had the power plant located right behind the main building, 
And so you can see there's some pictures of the Waco campus where you can see this power plant right behind it, and so it runs directly into the building. And so they just think, yeah, it was an electrical wiring, something just sparked, and then as soon as it did, I mean. There was no insulation on the wires. They were all knob and mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. Well, and one of the things when when we created the, the the new campus, the original buildings, they were built with reinforced concrete and steel. And I remember back in 2015 or so, we were tearing down the building behind Reed Hall that connected it to the old student center. And I remember talking to a guy who worked in building and grounds, and he was saying, yeah, we're going to get this thing torn down. It'll probably take us about two days. I said, oh, no. <laughs> it's going to take you much longer than that because of the reinforced concrete. It took them about four weeks to tear the building down. I can remember my brother, some years older than I am, but I was eight. He went to TCU, he went to TCU in the mid-50s. Yeah, I'd like to uh, jump in from that. Starting in the 1930s, there are a lot of foreign exchange students that start to attend TCU from different countries. Is this better? Yeah. All right, so there's a lot of foreign exchange students that enter TCU starting in the 1930s. Uh, we see articles in the student newspaper talking about students from Ecuador. Actually, a member of the Ecuadorian like royal family attends TCU in the 1930s. And it really takes off, but that was an excellent point. You start uh, really with the Divinity School. They, that is where you really bring in uh, students from all over the world to study at the Divinity School, and that leads to a lot of those students matriculating through from Africa, you know, and they're identified as separate from African Americans. So it's you know it, it's a messy kind of. We look at it now, and we think, wow, how you know, how could that be? But Thank you for your question and statement. Well, and one of the things that I think is very important about this, this book, and even when you travel on the TCU campus today, one of the things that stands out about the TCU campus is how you have buff colored brick and red clay gabled roofs. Well, when they first built the buildings in 1910, 1911, they used buff colored brick because it was the cheapest brick. And then the reason we have tiled gabled roofs, if you look at some of those early pictures, it showed flat roofs. Well, the reason they converted to clay tiled roof was because during World War II, the shortage of petroleum, and you could not get petroleum based shingles. So they started using clay tiled roofs. The first building on TCU's campus with a red clay tiled roof, Foster Hall, the second female dorm on campus. And then after that, they began converting the other buildings back to that style. 